It's funny that you say that. Yes. <laughs> because I... Let's study. Chapter one. <laughs> ask and it is given to you. <laughs> Thank you, Siri. <laughs> it's funny you say that, Jean, because, um, you know, I was looking at the metaphysics of the book of Esther, the allegory of Queen Esther, and besides studying the metaphysic, metaphysics, there's a lot of Bible movies, and I watched the 1999 version of the movie, and I loved it. So, at 12.30, I'm showing it here. So, you may stay if you still like. I think we have ice cream and all that. So, we continue our heroes and heroines of Hollywood, DC Comics, Marvel Comics, and the Bible today. And today, obviously, the spotlight is on the book of Esther, the allegory of Queen Esther, who, when she was a young girl, was known as Hadessa. I just want to start with the introduction by an excerpt from an article entitled, Is Esther True?, uh, written by Rabbi Gill. The Jewish holiday of Purim celebrates the story told in the biblical book of Esther. Yet as we read the Megillah, another word for story or narrative, some people ask whether the story is historically accurate. I kind of ask that question for pretty much most of the passages in the Bible. And has, historians have long questioned the historical nature or factual evidence of the events outlined in Esther. The Megillah reads more like a political thriller, and so does the movie, than a historical record or even a religious tale. Despite the clear historical setting, historians have found no evidence of the people of the events. So is Esther true? Some may respond that the book can be true even if it is not historically accurate. The great prophets of Israel taught us moral, not historical lessons. Even if the story is just a parable, it is chocked filled with metaphysical <coughs> lessons and spiritual truths that are equally strong if we so choose to walk into them. And so I look at the metaphorical symbolism, like all allegories, of the story of Esther. Now, mind you, you'll get a better version in the movie. Um, so I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest here. I'll be on the platform in 20 minutes, to the best of my ability. So there are many lessons in the book of Esther, but I would like to highlight uh, three, in three steps. You know, we all hear about the hero's journey. We hear, and it's said in many different ways, you know, how there's more than one path to Rome, so to speak. And they say it in different ways. And in Unity, we look at the cycle of endings or death, painful experience, being in the void, and the resurrection new life. So in the hero's journey, or in that cyclical aspect of our life, we have an initiation. We're faced with a painful event, something that brings us to our knees, that can paralyze us, or just cause us an ongoing nagging of pain and suffering. And in the book of Esther, she shows that through the activity of fasting and praying without ceasing, how one can be lifted from victim conscious, from anger, using anger in a way that calls us forward and in a way to rise to a greater evolution of our divinity, to claim our boldness in a way that we haven't had before. So we start off with Esther as a young girl, and she was born Jewish, and she was orphaned at a very young age. Very common. Even in our Marvel comics we have with Superman and Batman, 
um, we see that orphanage, right? One of the first hardships in life. But she's taken in by Mordecai, who in some accounts people call her uncle or her cousin, but it is a kinsman of Esther. And he takes her in and they live a very comfortable, very pleasant life. And actually, um, being Jewish, um, he actually had the opportunity to learn how to be a scribe, which was not common for the Jewish people. They lived among the Persians, and they hid their identity. And so life was going along pretty swimmingly or contently until one fateful day. 180-day celebration of the king of Persia, Persia, Persia was taking place. And on that day, he decided to call for his queen, and at the time it was Queen Vashti, to come and present herself be, before him and all the noble men for their pleasure. And Queen Vashti said, no. I will not be exploited, and I will not be used in that way. And so, she was banished from the kingdom. So I want to look at the metaphysics of both of these characters. First, we start with the king of Persia. He is that representation of grandiosity. Our will, our choices, our actions that are, that are categorized by ambition, of greed, of selfishness, gluttony. And Vashti represents that aspect where we say, no, I will not prostitute myself in any way. Not just sexually, but I will not get, act against my integrity, my spiritual principle, and the job I have if I'm asked to do something that does not resonate with me. I will not hold on to a relationship that requires me to walk away from something I hold near and dear, something I value, something that is in alignment with my spiritual principle. And it is also when we stay stuck in the same pattern, in that same victim mentality, never taking that step. So we see now, with the absence, Queen Vashti is on the right there, there is a need. And so there's a call out to the surrounding town, asking to round up all the young women to be cleaned up, to be bathed in oil, and to be sent it one by one before the king, to have a night with the king, until he chooses the one of his liking. Now, her uncle, Mordecai, as he hears the decree and the soldiers are descending upon the town, he tries to hide her. He shoves her underneath the stable, in the stable, underneath all the hay. But, unfortunately, she's found out, she's discovered. And as she's getting ready to leave, he grabs her by the face and he says, you will no longer be called Hadassah. You are Esther. Now he did that because he didn't want them to know in the royal palace that she was Jewish. So it was for her safety. But the metaphysics of that is when we take on a new name, right? The rite of passages, whether it's confirmation, whether you get bar mitzvah, um, in spiritual practices, Sometimes, after undergoing an intensive spiritual training, we take on that name to represent that we're ready to step into a higher plane of being. And so that is the symbolism there. And she is heartbroken. She is distressed beyond belief. And that represents that height of pain and suffering in our life where we're taken to the knees, like I said, that initiation. And so she is cleaned up, and it's actually quite comical in the movie, this part, where she's taught all the etiquette, and the way she's supposed to be, how she's not supposed to look at the king through the eyes, blah, blah, blah. And then finally, she is ready, and 
and she is presented before the king. Now there's something right away that the king notices different about Esther. For she has been going within. And how do I say to the truth of my being? And Esther metaphysically means the power of spiritual love. A lot of times we get confused about love, what I like, what I don't like, that warm, fuzzy. But it is the power to harmonize and unify all of our thoughts, our actions, in alignment with our divine nature from our highest place. And so she is, through the best of her ability, through her pain and suffering, she steps forward and she does what she's supposed to do. And at the same time, the king notices there's something very different about her. That she expresses this kind of courage, yet vulnerability, yet honesty, yet humility. And he is, you can see that he is taken by that. And so she is selected to be the queen. Now, behind the scenes, as she's now learning to be in her new life, she gets sent off in her chambers, and the king will call her at his pleasure. And behind the scenes, we see her uncle, Mordecai, and the prime minister under the king, Haman. There's this rivalry happening. And Haman represents our fear, anxious thoughts. When something happens, we get into the whirling, um, the, the whirling thoughts where we can perseverate on things, where we can get stuck on our anger, our pain, our victimhood, our pityness. And Mordecai represents that desire to lean into spiritual truth, to speak to and to claim the spiritual truth in the situation, regardless of what's going on. So Haman had devised this secret plan because he also wanted to overthrow the king. He was greedy for power. And so he decided he was going to have this plot. Well, Mordecai found out about the plot because he could read, describe the plan, and he sent it secretly to the king. Now, all this time, they do not know that Mordecai and Esther are related. So the king says, I want to know, I want to know, who found out this plot and saved my life? And they told him it was Mordecai. So now the plot thickens, right? <laughs> Haman is not too pleased with this because Mordecai now is given special honors. He's been given a special home to live in. And he's presented with royalty and all of the goodness. So now because his jealousies intensified Haman, you know, sometimes it represents that actions we take when we're so angry. We think things are so unfair. And so now he, does not, he devises a plan to kill all the Jews, all of them. So Mordecai finds out he is wailing, he is grief-stricken. Somehow he gets a message to Esther. Esther discovers the plan, and she too is overcome, beside herself. Now this represents for us when the pain gets so bad being in the consciousness or in the action and the activity of where we are, we are tired of either imploding or exploding or vomiting on people, and we are faced with a choice to rise. Continue or rise. In the 12-step program that is being brought to your knees, it is hitting rock bottom. Have you ever gotten to a point where you knew the way you were existing was no longer serving you and you could not tolerate it? If you have experienced that, raise your hand. So Queen Esther says, okay, I'm going to rise higher. So she engages in fasting. And I'm going to read a quote from the book of Esther here. In Esther, um, chapter 1, verse 
chapter 4, verse 16. Go, gather all the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night and day, and I and my attendants will fast as well. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So I want to look at this fasting. Many of you are aware of fasting when it comes to food. Orsini and Lisa are awesome and are knowledgeable on intermittent fasting. And if you want to know more, please see them and you can see the results and their glowingness and their health. And so we see that is taking out of our diets those things that maybe do not nourish us. But fasting is also, through the ages, has been a spiritual practice. And it is more than just food, it's on all levels of being. Body, mind, emotion, action, thought, and spiritual practice. So we begin to take an inventory, separating our Hammond thoughts those that are alignment, aligned with our lower consciousness that keep us chained to victim consciousness and we separate from that out the Mordecai, those truths that we hold. And as we do that inventory, we fast from those things that no longer serve us. So we know fasting is also part of the power of elimination. When we engage in affirmative prayer through the use of a denial. And there are statements like this. It's not denying what's happening in the physical world, but it's denying that it will have power over you or that it can take away anything from you. So if I lose my job, and a denial would be, the loss of this job does not have the power to label me as a loser, a victim, or unworthiness. And an affirmation of claiming the truth would be, I affirm that I use, I use my divine, unique gifts to abundantly bless myself and the world. Now we can't just stop with the words. Because that's what I meant last week when I said prayer without works is dead. That means our whole life is our prayer. If I am denying that I am unlovable, if my partner left, and I am left in a very difficult situation, and I deny that my partner's betrayal does not define me as unlovable, and then I affirm I am love expressing, I give and receive love freely, and I do that sit in the silence, that's beautiful, but then I go out, I must embody it now. Because if I affirm, I deny and affirm, and then start barking at my kids, my spouse, the woman at the bank, the person who's in front of me, who's driving too slow, that is prayer without works. So it is that call to embody that which we desire. And when we can distinguish our fear thoughts, from our spiritual thoughts, and then sit in the silence, we receive divine wisdom, knowing what is our first step that is before us. And so that is what Queen Esther did. I will go against the law, not spiritual law, but the law that makes no sense, that goes against the people, that goes against spiritual truth, that goes against my integrity. I will embody my compassion, my courage, and I will go before the king, which she did. And so she knelt, and nobody did that. She was shaking. And so the king said, okay, Esther, what would you like to share? And they were all horrified, but he paused. And she said, I would like to throw you this banquet for Hammond and for you. Okay, so they go to the, the banquet, and she cleverly reveals the plot to kill the Jews. With that knowing, 
that Hammond has been working behind his back both to kill him and to kill the Jews, he orders Hammond to be hanged. And metaphysically, that's when we transcend and those fear thoughts, those anxious thoughts, those worry thoughts, no longer have power over us. And we are called to that higher place. Now she did not just step into that for herself. For when we step into a greater expression of ourselves, we are to share it with others. We are to put a hand out to others. Now in doing and being in her integrity, they actually fall in love with each other, a genuine love, one that is spiritually rich in truth. But she doesn't stop here and say, you know what? I got my man. I got the jewels. I got all the wine I can drink. My uncle, he's cool. We're good. No, she reached out. She reached out to her kinsmen, her Jewish people, and not only in her lifting, she lifted others. That's what all the masters called us to do. Whether it's Jesus or Buddha, Mother Teresa, they didn't just say, do your affirmation, sit in the silence, stay in your spiritual group. Those are all good. But whatever small way we are being called to be it to others, we are to step into that, especially today. We know all around us the hate crimes, the discrimination that is occurring right here in Newark, New Jersey. The water is poisoned. And like I said, we, we can't just talk about these spiritual truths and then do nothing with them. So I ask you, how can you lend a hand to those who are labeled wrongly less than? How do you help the people, my friends? And if anybody wants to think of some ideas we can do collectively, I'm here for that. And so I invite you to look at whatever is causing suffering, initiation in your life. How can you separate your Hammond thoughts from your Mordecai thoughts? How can you call forth and embody the courage, the wisdom, and the audacity to act like Queen Esther and step and rise in a greater expression of your divinity? That is the challenge I give you. And I end with a quote from Esther. Perhaps this is the moment for which you have been created. For we are the ones we are waiting for, my friends. Have a blessed, joy-filled, and week-filled with service. And so it is.